The following special episode of Addressing Gettysburg is brought to you without commercial interruption by our Patreon page. Just go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg so you can help support the show and keep it going and growing. Just go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg and help us help you. That's patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg. And we thank you in advance. Now on with the show. You're listening to Addressing Gettysburg. Sites, you don't yes. even have to give me credit. I love it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Ken No. I'm the only thing standing between you and dinner. <laughs> For the next three hours, we're going to be <laughs> discussing the wonders of Civil War weather. No, that's not actually going to happen at all. Um, sitting here in the front row is my friend and former student, Nick Phillips sitting exactly where he used to sit in my classroom at Auburn University. And if I go past 45 minutes, Nick's going to throw something at me. So uh, we'll get you to dinner on time. And since Pete gave me that, that lovely introduction, I should point out that, yes, I do have University of Illinois football season tickets. <laughs> and if you're interested, you can too. There are seats available. <laughs> whole lot of seats. <laughs> Weathering the Civil War. In environmental history. Let me start out with a confession. I'm, I'm not really a trained environmental historian. As somebody said to me recently, you're a Civil War guy. I'm a Civil War guy. I'm trained pretty traditionally. But over 20 years ago, I wrote a book about the Battle of Perryville, and you cannot understand Bragg's Kentucky campaign or Perryville without understanding that it took place in a drought. That got me thinking about how the environment affected the Civil War more generally. And so I read a lot. I learned a lot from people who are on our panel today, like Megan Nelson and Tim Silver, and others, they're, they're, they're my mentors, really, when it comes to environmental history. And I'm happy to say that Megan told me a few minutes ago that I'm almost off probation. So who knows, maybe I could be an environmental historian someday. We'll see. I want to start out with a quotation from somebody you will recognize from Stonewall Jackson's staff. We were just talking about Jackson and Lee. Henry Kidd Douglas, the author of I Rode with Stonewall, or as our friend Gary Gallagher likes to call it, Stonewall Rode with Me. <laughs> Kidd Douglas did have a healthy ego. Um, this quotation comes from the end of the Seven Days Battles. The Peninsula Campaign was fought in incredibly wet weather. It rained pretty much every other day and created all sorts of mud for the Army of the Potomac to march through. The rain pretty much stopped not long before the Seven Days Battles, and through the Seven Days there was a great deal of heat with occasional thunderstorms. And then the night of Malvern Hill, the last of the Seven Days Battles, the rain came back and it poured and poured and poured. The Army of the Potomac retreated down to Harrison's Landing in that storm. Read about that retreat in the official records and you will find a lot of brigade commanders and regimental commanders talking about what their regiments did in the fighting, what their brigades did on this day or that day, but they all talk about how horrible that retreat was. And there's some evidence that the Army of the Potomac pretty much came unglued that night. The Confederates held the field at Malvern Hill, which meant that they were out in that same storm trying to find the wounded, bring in the wounded, locate their dead. And it was just a mess. It was a horrible mess. And Kid Douglas wrote of that night, quotation you see here, the howling of the storm the cry of the wounded and the groans of the dying, 
the glare of the torch upon the faces of the dead or into the shining eyes of the speechless wounded, looking up in hope of relief, the ground slippery with a mixture of mud and blood, all in the dark, hopeless, starless night. Surely it was a gruesome picture of war at its most horrid shape. That quotation has haunted me since I first read it. Sometimes I think I could sum up my interest in Civil War weather just by referring to that quotation. The mud and the blood. I want to suggest to you that over the last 160 years, roughly, we haven't approached these two elements equally. We spend a lot of time thinking and writing about the blood, fighting, battles, the soldiers. But we seem to have forgotten the mud, the rain, the snow, the heat, the cold. As Civil War soldiers and civilians experienced it. A people more used to living and working outdoors than we are. Nonetheless, confronted with conditions that they could never have imagined. Now, it's not that we've forgotten entirely about the weather. Any good book about a battle is going to tell you about the weather. But we haven't given it I think as much emphasis as we should. And I'm not the first historian to make that argument. A few minutes ago, Pete referred to Douglas Southall Freeman, great biographer of Lee, later the author of Lee's Lieutenants. 1953, Freeman gave his last public address before he died. And in that address, he pointed to several things that Civil War historians needed to do essentially after his death. And one of them was that we know nothing about the weather, he said. We know almost nothing about the conditions in which these armies fought. Surely the information is out there. Perhaps we should just drop everything for the next five years and see if we can find it, and then we'll understand the Civil War better. Uh, and he wasn't the only person to think that. Uh, last week, I was in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, doing some research going through the T. Harry Williams papers. All of you know, I imagine, T. Harry Williams, Lincoln, and his generals. Reading through that, and there was a letter from Mark Boatner. How many of you know the name Mark Boatner? Okay, Civil War Dictionary, right? Boatner had written Williams a letter saying, I'm thinking about writing this book called the Civil War Dictionary, and I think it would cover this, that, and the other, but I'm not sure how deep I should go. For example, I'm thinking about writing about the weather. Williams wrote him back and said, that would be marvelous. But it didn't happen. And it didn't happen for many years. About a dozen years ago, I went to a small conference in Athens, Georgia. It was the first conference that I know of that brought together Civil War historians and environmental historians. And we all sort of stared at each other for a while and wondered if we could communicate. We did in the end, it went very nicely. And I gave my very first paper on this topic. I'd been working on it a little bit. So I got up in front of a group, and I began, because I thought, you know, joke might loosen people up, you know, went over the audience. I stood there and I said, the Civil War was fought outside. And some of you are actually laughing, thank you. Because no one laughed that day. There are people in this room who were there. No one laughed. But later, folks explained to me that they didn't laugh because they took me seriously. And I'm going to suggest that you too should take this notion seriously. The Civil War was largely fought 
outside. It was not fought in a nice air-conditioned lecture hall. It was not fought in your den. It was not fought in a classroom. It was not fought in some large domed stadium with artificial turf and the temperature is always 72 degrees. If we think of the Civil War that way, then it becomes easy to slip into thinking things like, how on earth could McClellan not get up the peninsula? Surely he must have been lazy or not very bright or otherwise problematic. How could Meade not have kept Lee from crossing the Potomac after the Gettysburg battles? But the war was fought outside, in the mud and the rain and the sleet and the snow. And it was harder for people to do things than we imagine it must have been. So if you take nothing else away from my talk today, I hope you remember that. The Civil War was fought outside. Now, when I was in Athens, and we were actually beginning to talk to environmental historians, and they were talking to us, I learned something really important, something that every basic environmental historian knows, uh, but something that was kind of new to me and I think new to other people. And that's the notion of agency, which you see down here at the bottom of the slide. Agency. The environment, weather in my case, has agency. It doesn't mean it has a brain. That doesn't mean it has an agenda. That doesn't mean it's sort of rubbing its hands together, saying to itself, I'm going to stick it to George McClellan, and he's never going to know what hit him. But by the same token, it's not background scenery. It's not like a painted backdrop you might see in a play. It's active. It's out there. It's part of the war. For me, it became useful to think of the war a little bit differently. When I was growing up, we were still thinking about the Civil War as something between the blue and the gray, the north and the south. As we know, both of those statements are problematic. Reality is a lot more complicated than both of them. But you might find it helpful to think about this war as a war between the blue, the gray, and the weather. And the weather was a fickle ally. As I will point out toward the end of my talk, more often than not, it favored the Union cause, the federal cause, but not always. And sometimes you just couldn't trust it at all if you were on either side. But it's always there, it's always acting, it's shaping things. It matters. The Civil War was fought outside. Weather and the environment have agency. They're active. They're part of the story. So, here are some basics. Do not worry, this is not going to turn into a meteorology class. But there are some basics I would like you to know before we actually move back into the war. So let's talk about Civil War weather. Civil War weather, to use the technical term, was weird. It was not normal. Don't we always assume that, eh, you know, the weather is probably what the weather is now. Uh, there was nothing particularly exciting or different happening in those years, right? And actually, that's not true at all. That's not true at all. First of all, in the western half of the modern United States, between about 1845 and the end of the Civil War, growing even worse in the last few years before the war and during the war, was a massive drought in the West that had all sorts of ramifications on American history. When this drought began, for example, the Comanche Empire was strong enough and powerful enough to hold off both the Mexican army and the federal army. At the end of this drought, that was no longer the case. When your power as warriors 
is built on buffalo, and buffalo have to eat grass, and all the grass is dying. The great Civil War drought will affect places like the Indian Territory, modern Oklahoma, where a great deal of hunger was taking place in 1861 and helped propel the civilized tribes into supporting the Confederacy. Certainly in the uh, Southwestern campaign, Henry Sibley's campaign, which Megan Nelson has written so brilliantly about. The Great Civil War drought is something that meteorologists and geographers talk about regularly. I study the Civil War seriously, professionally, since the mid-1980s when I went to the University of Illinois. I never heard of the Great Civil War drought. I had no idea that there were people in other fields talking about this. But they were. Now, there's also a very interesting meteorological phenomenon known as the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO. And if you watch your local TV weather, you've probably heard a bit about El Nino. We've been in a La Nina year, but we're now entering into an El Nino, El Nino year. And you may wonder what all that's about. And it's, it's pretty complicated. But, I mean, the basics are this. If you look at the map up here, the two maps of the Pacific, in what we might call a normal year, currents move from east to west, from the western coast of South America over toward modern Indonesia, Australia, and they carry warm water with it. Pretty simple, right? So the water off the coast of, say, Peru is colder than the water off the coast of Northern Australia. That's what usually happens. That's a normal year. Some years, for reasons that no one still understands, those currents shift and water begins to move from west to east. Water off the coast of Northern Australia or in Indonesia gets a few degrees colder. Water off the coast of Peru gets a few degrees warmer, four or five degrees. The waves wash those warmer temperatures up into the air, and condensation takes place, and it goes into the atmosphere, and currents start to shift, and the jet stream starts to move, and weather patterns change around the world. It's called an El Nino because it usually starts in December. Not this year, but it usually starts in December. Hence El Nino, the Christ child. It comes around Christmas time. Clearly, something was happening during the Civil War years. There's some disagreement. For a while, the reigning theory was that the Civil War years were largely marked by something called La Nina. Just think of La Nina as extreme normal. A La Nina year generally means, as you see up here, hot and dry summers in the south in the war zone, cold winters in the northeast. When I was at that conference in Georgia, I met the incredible forensic meteorologist, Kerry Mock, who's trying to rebuild what we know about 19th century weather. And at that time, there was a thought that La Nina extended during the Civil War. So I started working on my research, and I wrote a book chapter for the wonderful book Fields of Battle, which two of our other participants this weekend Drew Bledsoe and Andy Lang wrote. And I sent my chapter off to Professor Kerry Mock, seeking some sort of approval. And he said, well, no, because we kind of changed our mind about that. We, we're starting to think now that 1861, yeah, was probably a La Nina year. Think about the heat at First Manassas. Think about the incredible heat during the Wilson's Creek campaign. 
where unit cohesion started to completely fall apart and then we're fighting each other in the same army for water. But it's starting to look like that 1862 and 1864 and probably 1866 were El Nino years of increasing severity. And an El Nino year, and we're going into one right now, so look for it, El Nino years tend to bring really cold and rainy winters in the South, among other things. Richard Grove, George Adamson, a couple of scholars who have made really strong cases that these were El Nino years. This is happening during the Civil War. Something else happening in the Civil War. Uh, when Professor Mock wrote me back, he said, you know, El Nino is important, but you also should think about the North Atlantic Oscillation. And I think I said, what? What's the North Atlantic Oscillation? They don't talk about the North Atlantic Oscillation on the Weather Channel. What are we talking about here? But it turns out this is really important, too. There is, look at the bottom illustration showing the globes. There is a permanent low pressure system around Iceland. And there is a permanent high pressure system uh, around the Azores. But the degree of difference between barometric pressure readings of those two systems varies over time. Sometimes it gets wider. And you call that a positive North Atlantic oscillation. But sometimes those differences become less than usual. And that becomes a negative North Atlantic oscillation. And that affects weather on the East Coast, and it affects weather in Europe. When Hitler's and armies invaded Russia, it was a negative North Atlantic oscillation year. When the Battle of the Bulge took place, in all of that snow, in those horrible conditions in the Ardennes, it was a negative North Atlantic oscillation year. And it turns out that 1862, 1864, and 1865 were also negative North Atlantic oscillation years. So you've got a negative NAO. You've also got El Nino, El Nino working. And the combination of the two means that Civil War weather is going to be volatile and unusual and strange enough for people to notice. Well, that's great, but that's not why I'm here. Tell me about the Civil War. Okay. Summer and fall of 1861. Almost certainly La Nina year. Not much disagreement about that. Was an extremely hot summer. I've mentioned Manassas. I've mentioned Wilson's Creek. Then in December of 1861, there was snow, as you might expect. But then something very unusual happened. It became very, very warm, spring-like. Mothers and wives in Virginia were writing their soldiers, saying things like, we can't believe how warm it is. The flowers are blooming. Our daffodils are coming up. It's December. We have no idea what's going on. The world seems to be turned on its ear. We've never seen anything like this before. It was so warm by the end of December 1861 that Stonewall Jackson thought, hey, I have an idea. Why don't we move troops up to Bath and Romney and better protect the Shenandoah Valley from those Federals who have moved into West Virginia? And on the first day of the Bath-Romney campaign, a lot of you know this, the weather was so nice that soldiers just threw away their coats. We're not going to need these. I don't want to carry all this extra weight. Off we go. It turned cold in the afternoon, and before they knew it, they were marching into one of the most frozen, cold campaigns in the Civil War. For those of you who know Star Wars, they were on Hoth. <laughs> and they suffered tremendously, and Jackson's troops began, again, to fight among themselves and you know, complain that Jackson's favoring his Stonewall Brigade over other troops. And there are all these problems that 
you know, really grow out of launching a campaign in these terrible winter conditions. The winter, spring into the early summer of 1861 was unseasonably cold and unseasonably wet. It was so wet in much of the Confederacy that farmers were at least a month late getting their crops into the field. In some cases, South Carolina, for example, they actually had to plow up fields and replant. My grandparents owned a farm in southwest Virginia. Um, I worked that farm pretty much all my life until I went off to graduate school. You cannot plant in mud. And so they're getting their crops in late. Now, in terms of the war, I could probably just rely on you to tick off what was happening. Flooded Fort Henry. Fort Donelson, with all that sleet and snow. Uh, high water and flooding at Shiloh. Flooding on the peninsula, spreading out those malarial swamps that Catherine Shively Meyer writes so well about. The flooded Chickahominy that entirely shaped the latter part of the Peninsula Campaign and the Seven Days and gave Lee the opportunity to hit the Federal Fifth Corps. That's probably El Nino and a negative North Atlantic oscillation. And then in the summer, um, depends on where you were when this started, it quit raining. It really quit raining. Aside from thunderstorms and occasional showers, the war zone shifted into drought conditions. So now you have crops in the field. They're a month late. They're not as high as they should be. And now they're starting to die of lack of water. Think about what that's going to do to the southern economy and southern bellies in feeding Confederate soldiers. And in terms of campaigns, obviously it's going to have an effect as well. I cut my teeth writing about the Perryville campaign. Perryville campaign was shaped from beginning to end by the drought west of the Appalachians. Braxton Bragg chose his course into Kentucky in the first place, trying to find water. The battle itself began as a fight over a few springs of water. The Confederate battle line is shaped by a river, Chaplin River, that has gone dry. When Don Carlos Buell's army got up to Louisville, a lot of them were so fed up with him and fed up with military service that they walked home to Indiana. They walked home from Louisville because the Ohio River was shallow enough they could do it. And it didn't get much better for a while. William Stark Rosecrans takes command of what's going to become the Army of the Cumberland uh, after the Perryville campaign. His army ends up in Nashville. There's a lot of pressure from Washington. Why aren't you moving? Why aren't you doing something? Rosecrans says, I've got to supply my men, but I can't because the Cumberland River is still so low, we can't get boats down here with supplies. We have to rely on railroads, and the Confederates are stupid. They're hitting the railroads. So we're going to have to wait until I've got enough equipment and food and forage to go after Bragg. So that's 1862. What happened in 1863? Same thing. What happened in 1864? The same thing, except the drought moved north. Still in Virginia, hit by rainy planting seasons and later drought for three years in a row. Still in Missouri, but now moves into the northern states. There are other things happening as well that I think are useful to know if you're trying to understand the Civil War a bit better. 
early frosts. Massive cold weather system came out of Canada through the American Midwest the end of August 1863. August. Crops freezing, dying in the fields. Then there was a second black frost, as they called it, in the middle of September. That cold weather system stretched all the way from Canada through the Midwest into the South and into East Tennessee. Those of you who know the Chickamauga campaign will remember the soldiers have been writing about how hot it was. It's hot. We can't believe how hot it is. And then the night before Chickamauga, what happened? It turned cold. And the next night, wounded men were dying in the cold. And soldiers who had survived the first day of Chickamauga were trying to stay warm. It's this system. So it affects the battlefield. It also affects the home front. Where I live now, Champaign, Illinois, there's a band, you can, you can trace it on a map using newspapers from the period. There's a band of weather that runs across central Illinois, across central Indiana, through Indianapolis, into Ohio, and in that area, 50% of farmers' crops died in the field before they could be harvested because of these early frosts. Think about the effect that's going to have on the northern economy. Until the Great Depression, there were elderly people in the American Midwest who talked about something they called the cold new year, the coldest day they had ever experienced. West of the Appalachians, it was January 1st, 1864. East of the Appalachians, here in Gettysburg, for example, it was January 2nd. High temperature, Cincinnati, on New Year's Eve, 44 degrees, not so bad. High temperature, January 1st, seven below. And it stayed cold throughout the country for almost a month. There are people writing in Florida about how unseasonably cold it is. There are soldiers complaining about the cold. Probably none in worse shape than James Longstreet's troops in East Tennessee, already poorly supplied, already desperate for shoes, and then this incredible cold weather system hits them. And it doesn't just affect Confederates. This is the period when U.S. Grant tries to start thinking about something to do with his troops. Maybe go to Mobile. Maybe go to Atlanta. Because the weather, snow, ice, cold, are so bad in East Tennessee, he can't do anything there. He tries to go on a, a tour of his, his troops to see what's happening, and he gives up because he can't get from place to place. It's that bad. I think this is really important. I don't know about you, but when I was a lot younger and I was first learning about the Civil War, uh, one of the stories that people used to tell us was that King Wheat had defeated King Cotton. All of those northern soldiers had gone off to fight the Federal Army, and yet because of things like mechanization and new business ideas, the North produced more food than ever and could feed Europe and do all of these wonderful things. And it's simply not true. Because one of the things that came out of the Civil War was the Department of Agriculture. And we have Department of Agriculture records and we have newspaper reports. And we know that the peak for agricultural production in the free states during the Civil War era was 1862. It went downhill noticeably in 1863, in part because of those frosts that killed the harvest. Picked up somewhat in 1864, but you, by then you got the drought going on. And here's something I never knew. This became an issue in the 1864 presidential campaign. This became an issue for Abraham Lincoln because Democrats, throwing all sorts of other mud at Lincoln, 
said, we're having a drought. We're going to go hungry because our boys are at the front. We're wasting money and time and food and supplies on this war. Department of Agriculture and friendly newspaper editors like Horace Greeley responded with all sorts of editorials and reports to show we're okay. Things aren't great, but we can handle this. It's an issue that we've completely forgotten about. People often ask me about unusual weather. Uh, one thing that points to El Nino years during the heart of the Civil War is the fact that there are only three major hurricanes that strike the American coast during the war. Just three, which would be something you would expect from El Nino years. The so-called equinoctical storm, September 27th and 28th, 1861, comes on the equinox, it shows up on the equinox. As someone who studied the Civil War in Appalachia for much of my career, this is where all of that incredible rain came from that flooded Confederate and federal camps in what is now northern West Virginia, Shenandoah Valley, Washington, where camps on hillsides were literally coming downhill like sledders. The so-called expedition hurricane, which was probably tropical storm by the time it hit the Carolina coast, but still with enough power to break up uh, Ambrose Burnside's expedition to the North Carolina coast and delay it for several days. And finally, a hurricane that we completely forgot about. I mentioned Kerry Mock a few minutes ago. Kerry Mock and his research partner, Mike Chenoweth, discovered in their diligent search of ship logs that almost certainly a hurricane came ashore in the Florida Panhandle. May 28, 1863, uh, it had no name. They call it Hurricane Amanda because it sank a ship in the federal blockading fleet, the USS Amanda. Three hurricanes. Tornadoes, people sometimes ask me that too. What about tornadoes, possible tornadoes? Well, I'm sure there are a lot, but I was able to document at least five possible tornadoes that had an effect on the war. And you see the dates no, you don't actually, sorry about that. <laughs> I used animations on that slide, didn't I? Um, May 2nd, 1862, Nathaniel Banks' army moving against Stonewall Jackson. His men describe something that looks a whole lot like a tornado. The Confederates don't, but Banks and his men describe tornado-like conditions. April 4th. 1863, a tornado definitely hits Vicksburg, takes out a good chunk of the city. May 4th, 1863, all of you know that's near the end of the Battle of Chancellorsville. Think about Hooker stuck across the river from his army. Think about the terrible rain that came at the end of that battle. And Union soldiers and Confederate aid stations on the field Drowning, drowning because of the rain. And there are storms that appear to be tornadoes. May 1st, 1864, on the Rapidan, it delays. Grant and Meade's march into central Virginia. May 11th and 12th, 1864, tornadoes absolutely strike in and around Richmond. This is the night of Yellow Tavern. This is the day that Jeb Stewart dies. And all of you have probably read stories about how hard it was to bring Stewart's body back into Richmond with those terrible storms threatening the city. What about battles and campaigns? When I first started this project, I, um, I think I made a mistake. I associated the word weather with bad weather. I thought about my grandfather. I mentioned he was a farmer. He was also a former sailor. He learned all sorts of interesting expressions in the Navy, almost none of which I can repeat to you. <laughs> I heard profanity that I have never heard since. Some of it was really inventive. <laughs> 
But something he used to say a lot that was not profane, when the skies turn dark, he would look at me or look at my grandmother and he would say, it's fixing to weather. It's fixing to weather. That's a Navy term. It's fixing to weather. So I tended to think about bad weather. Like the ice and the sleet and the snow at Fort Donaldson. Like the rain right at the end of the Battle of Gettysburg that affected the pursuit to the Potomac and shaped it in all sorts of dramatic ways. Like the Battle of Mill Springs in Kentucky, where a lot of the Confederates were equipped with flintlocks still at the beginning of 1862. And flintlocks do not work really well in damp and rainy weather and may have shaped the outcome of that battle. Like Jubal Early's campaign against Washington in 1864. Here we see President Lincoln standing at Fort Stevens. Get down, you fool. They're going to shoot your head off. You have all heard that story. It was incredibly hot and dusty. Temperatures approaching 100 degrees. So many men falling out of line in Early's columns that he got to Washington with much less strength than he started out with after Monocacy. And he got there a day late because they were moving so slowly because of the incredible heat and the dust that they were breathing in, not a whole lot different than what we've been breathing in the last few days. I'm not much of a what-if historian, but you know, that one day might have made a difference. Because early shows up about the same time that reinforcements show up from Grant's army. Technically, Meade's army. What if you'd been a day earlier? What if early had been able to get into Washington even for a few hours? But good weather affects battles, too. When he got to Savannah, William Tecumseh Sherman wrote to President Lincoln and admitted that one of the reasons for his success was that the weather had been so good. Warm enough to be comfortable, not too hot, so we became fatigued. Just enough rain to keep dust clouds from rising. The weather was perfect. The great American weather historian David Ludlam called it Yankee weather. It was perfect for the Federals. It wasn't perfect for the Confederates. Those of you who are taking the bus tour to Antietam on Monday, weather at Antietam was almost perfect. Same deal, not too hot, not too cold. There had just been enough moisture to keep dust clouds down. There was a bit of musty smell in the morning coming off the farms. About the only real impact at Antietam was the drought that I talked about, the 1862 drought, which meant that Antietam Creek was lower than it normally is. Something to think about the next time you try to cross the creek at Burnside's Bridge and see if it can be done. Of course, the banks are still pretty darn steep. But the water was lower. And speaking of soil, dust, let me say just a little bit, a little bit, about soil. I learned a lot about soil. My wife calls this the mud book. I talked to real soil mechanics at Auburn University to find out what was going on, and I learned that there are all sorts of complicated, interesting ways to classify soil. And real geologists like Scott Hippensteel, who's just written a book about this, will point out that you know some of the soil, the rock, on the northern side of Antietam is different than on the southern side of the battlefield. So you can get really complicated. But the most basic level, like learning your ABCs, the most basic level of understanding soil is based on this map. There are 12 distinct kinds of so-called soil orders, different kinds of soil in the United States. Now, let me ask you a question. 
I told my former student, Nick, that there was going to be small groups and audience participation. I may have exaggerated a bit, but I'm going to ask you a question. When you look at that map, thinking about the Civil War, does anything stand out to you? Does anything seem noticeable? Sir? Yeah, there you know, the Confederates used to talk about the sacred soil of the South. It's not universal, right? I mean, Florida's a little different. Soil's a little different along the Mississippi. Soil's a little different in Appalachia from where I'm from. But by and large, if you look at this map, the Confederacy is orange. That is technically called Altasol. When I lived in Georgia and Alabama for 31 years, we called it red clay. And red clay is sticky and wet. And as federal soldiers said when they encountered it, it was bottomless. Most soils, if they're wet, you'll sink to a certain depth and then it gets drier, harder. You can pull your wagon out. You can pull your car out. But that level in red clay is so low that it seems like you just keep going. It seems like there's no bottom. So all those stories you've read in memoirs about horses sinking up to their ears and wagons sinking past their axles, all the stories that I used to think were hyperbole, they're true. They're true. Federal soldiers hated southern soil. And since they didn't understand modern geology, they just assumed that this was what? A remnant of slave labor-based agriculture. These white southerners have ruined their soil and turned it into this awfulness. Now, it's not complete, though. And just as all the Confederacy isn't orange, you can see a little bit of orange up north, right? Right on this map? Western Pennsylvania? Delaware? And I know it's hard to see. But there's a little orange finger poking up out of Maryland into Pennsylvania of this bottomless red clay altisol. Anybody want to guess where that is? I've given you a clue on the slide. Where might you find this? Hmm? Outside. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Basically. That's Adams County. I love that answer, by the way. Um, that's Adams County. Oh, that's, that's here. You can't, I know, you can't really, you're not supposed to go to the round tops right now. And if you go to Devil's Dune, you might have to swim. But there's just red clay all through there. I gave a talk over at Seminary Ridge a few years ago. And I think there were people that sort of believed me and sort of didn't. So I used to get emails. I mean, for a month, people were driving around the county, writing me things like, yeah, yeah. When Lee left here, he went across the mountains where the soil was different. It was still awful. It was still rainy. But there was a bottom. This is the line of Meade's, retreat, of Meade's pursuit. And yeah, he had a turnpike, but you know how turnpikes work. They get jammed up. People get off the road. They go off on the side. Troops start marching through the mud. They moved really well the first day. And they wore out their horses and mules so much that they couldn't get a lot of their artillery over the mountains to confront Lee at the Potomac. So that's here. That's the upper, upper right. That's, that's Georgia. Lower right, that's triangular field. There's your red clay. So what? So what? You've been sitting here. You've been thinking about what you want for dinner. Maybe you've been checking your phones. I don't know. Why do I care about this? Why should I, as a student of the Civil War, care about this? So what questions are really good questions? Why should you care? Here's some thoughts about why I think you should care. Good and bad weather shaped all the battles and campaigns that we study. 
If we study them, if we study the Gettysburg campaign or the Chancellorsville campaign or the Mansfield campaign, without thinking about the environment and weather in particular, we're going to miss something. Weather dramatically affected the home fronts, especially the Confederate. I mentioned how drought in 1864 became a political issue in the North. In the South, in the Confederacy, late planting, bad harvests, dramatically affected food supply in the Confederacy. And we have moved back to a position that historians rejected several years ago to the point that we need to think about parts of the Confederacy as being near famine. And there's a Confederate government in Richmond that only has so much food, and it has to make decisions about whom do we feed first, whom do we prioritize? The army or the civilian population? Davis administration chose to prioritize the army. A lot of civilians resented it. It created all sorts of fissures and problems within the Confederacy, leading some historians to argue that the Confederacy actually fell apart from within. The Great Richmond Bread Riot was caused by a lot of things. But most immediately, it was caused by flooding that cut off foods coming in from outside of the city. Federal soldiers were usually better equipped to deal with bad weather. They had, ultimately, rubber ponchos, shelter halves, which they hated, but at least it was better than waiting for a wagon carrying your tents, which were never going to show up because it was raining and it was muddy. They had more frequent uniform changes. They had the ability to get shoes more frequently. Not always. Sherman's men going through Georgia and the Carolinas, their uniforms just fell apart, their shoes fell apart, but that's kind of the exception. Northern industry could produce things that allowed the federal soldier to deal with weather better than the Confederate soldier who was relying either on shoddy replacements or just what they could pick up off the battlefield. There are all these accounts of the Army of, the Northern, Army of Northern Virginia at the end of 1863 sleeping under white federal tent flies. Never again will I criticize Jubal Early's men for stopping to loot those camps at Cedar Creek because it was October, it was turning cold, and they needed stuff. And there it was. Weather generally favored the Federals. It just did. If you chart battle by battle and campaign by campaign, it generally favored the Federals, but with notable exceptions. The Peninsula Campaign, the seven days after the battle here. And so the net effect, really, was not to help the North win. It's not like I'm saying, you know, the North won because of the weather. I would never say that. I do not believe in monocausality at all. No one thing causes anything. But weather clearly dragged out the war, I think, longer than it might have been otherwise. McClellan somehow gets into Richmond in 1862 in a normal year without it raining every other day. I don't know if that ends the war. Probably not. But would there have been a second confiscation act? Would there have been an Emancipation Proclamation? If Lee's, if Lee's trapped north of the Potomac, will there be a 13th Amendment? I don't know. I'm not a speculative historian, really, but you can't help it sometimes. <laughs> so let me close with a couple of points, and then we can, we can answer questions. There's a book there on the left by the late historian, Mike Davis, it's called Late Victorian Holocausts. Obviously not beach reading. But it's a great book. Now, it doesn't have much to do with the Civil War. It actually does begin with U.S. Grant and Julia embarking on their world tour after his second term as president. But by and large, this is a book about imperialism. This is a book about how, between, say, 1850 and 1914, a handful of European powers, the United States and Japan, were able to take over pretty much the rest of the world, to take over and divide up all of Africa except Ethiopia, to take control of most of Asia. How did they do it? Now, when I was teaching world history at Auburn, 
there was always that sort of classic list that you would talk about. Well, they did it because they had quinine to deal with malaria. They did it because they had the telegraph. They had steam engines. They had ocean-going technology that allowed the quicker transportation of people and troops. And most importantly, of course, if you remember world history, they had machine guns. But Mike Davis said, we've forgotten maybe the most important thing. That between 1887 and 1902, there were three major famines in Asia, parts of Africa, and parts of South America that were caused clearly by two things. Very strong El Ninos and the inability of those European governments to deal with the crisis. Older governments had been able to deal with these conditions over time. But what do you do in India, for example, when there's barely enough food, and most of it's riding those new railroads down to ports to be sent elsewhere in the world? Mike Davis said that working weather into our history of imperialism was, I'm quoting him, the secret history of the 19th century, a huge fact that we've forgotten. Now, I'm not saying that Civil War weather, or indeed Civil War environmental history, is the secret history of the Civil War. But I think it's a secret history. I think it's something that we've kind of forgotten. I think it's something that would help us understand the war a bit better if we start thinking about it again. I put Walt Whitman up here. Everybody in this room has heard Walt Whitman's most famous quote until you're tired of it. The real war will never get in the books. It's the most misquoted group of words, I think, in the American Civil War. Whitman wasn't saying, if you read the whole passage in Drum Taps, he wasn't saying that we'll, we will never be able to understand the war. He was saying we shouldn't. This war was so ugly, so horrible, we should try to forget about the worst aspects of it. We shouldn't dig too deeply. But we do. Here we are. Here we are. Wanting to get a little bit closer to the real war. So let me make a suggestion to you in closing. In this room, in other lecture halls this weekend, when you are out on your tours, take a few minutes and remind yourself that the Civil War was fought outside. In the rain, and the mud, and the snow. And if you do that in your future reading and your future studies, I think you can get a little bit closer to the real war. I think you can get a little bit closer to the war as its participants understood it. So even if it's raining on Monday, go. <laughs> Soldiers didn't have any choice. And if you get stuck, you're just participating in a historical reenactment. <laughs> Thank y'all. For a more in-depth discussion with this speaker, go to patreon.com slash addressing Gettysburg.